Hello and welcome. Today's subject is on balance, and the title of the talk is Living a Balanced Life in a Complex World. Balance is a subject that's on all of our minds. Today's um, many faceted ways to upset that balance are, are very apparent to all of us. We have many people telling us about balance these days, from things as balanced diet, uh, balancing work and leisure, balancing uh, profession and family life. All of these things require adjustments in our life. Balance is that state of stability where no area of our life is pulling us to one side or another and that prevents us from dealing with the many things that we're dealing with. Today we're going to talk about that. Not only about how to balance these different areas around us, which Yogananda uh, does talk about, many of them, but more importantly, how to balance the inner core of our being, our consciousness. And in that balanced consciousness, letting that flow out through our life and thus balancing all of the things that we have to deal with. Before we get into this fascinating subject, <laughs> let's begin with a period of meditation. Meditation is the cornerstone of these teachings of Yogananda, the cornerstone of, of what, we, what we teach. Um, meditation that we can go within and feel that peace and that joy and that bliss that is our natural state and feeling it and holding on to it we can then go back out and deal with our outward lives so let us find a chair um, sit upright and uh, we'll give you some instruction on how to meditate okay let's start with Assuming the correct posture here, you want to sit straight. Uh, our guru used to say the spine must be held erect. You don't want to lean against the back of the chair. If you can, sit upright. And you're trying to find that balanced place where there is no tension in the body or no tension in the muscles trying to hold you straight. Because when you can find that balanced way to sit, then your consciousness can more easily go within. You're not distracted. So you're sitting straight, your hands, you place them on the on your th junction of the thigh and the abdomen and holds you, kind of locks you in place. Your chest is out, abdomen in, head, neck, and spine all in a straight line. And then you take your eyes, you can close your eyes or keep your eyes half open, but you raise your eyes gently to this point between the eyebrows. This is the spiritual eye, the kutasta, the center of spiritual consciousness. It's where you focus. So both your eyes, without straining, it's just a very gentle lifting to this place. This is where you experience the higher states of consciousness. Our guru explained that when, when we're sleeping, our eyes actually go down. This is the subconscious. During the day when we're engaging with the outward world, our eyes are level with the world. But he said, when we focus our eyes at this point between the eyebrows, gently raise them to this point, that's where superconsciousness is. That's where we experience superconsciousness. So let us find that place, raise our eyes gently. Let's start with an opening prayer, with deepest attention. Feel like you're praying from your heart. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, teach me to dive into the ocean of meditation again and again, deeper and deeper, until I find there the pearl of thy presence. Bless me, bless my efforts. Om. Peace. Amen. begin the meditation. Let's chant one of the cosmic chants. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. 
I will never forget thee, I will never forsake thee. Feel it as you chant it. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget thee, I will never forsake thee. I will never forget thee, I will never forsake thee. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget thee. I will never forsake thee. I will never forget thee. I will never forsake thee. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget thee. I will never forsake thee. I will never forget thee. I will never forsake thee. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song.
living a balanced life in a complex world. Balance, that state of well-being, that state of stability, where we feel like we're in control of things around us, that we're attending to the different areas of our life in the proper proportional way. This is the state that we're all seeking. And I don't think that many of us um, would deny that in today's world, balance is a big subject. It's usually in various areas of our life, whether it be um, having a balanced diet, uh, balancing exercise in a sedentary life, um, balancing your profession with your family, balancing work and leisure. All of these different areas require a degree of balance, otherwise we become um, too engrossed in certain things and it takes us away from that center of happiness and peace and well-being. Now in yoga, uh, this teaching that our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda gave to us, he's very specific about these different areas of balance that we need in our life and he gives very um, adequate and, and uh, many times profound instructions on how to balance these areas. Things like diet, things like, um, things like uh, not becoming a workaholic, not um, balancing work and meditation, balancing uh, friendships, balancing uh, time in solitude with time with others. These sorts of things all require some degree of, of input from ourselves that we can adjust them for our highest benefit. We do have to work on these small areas in order to uh, keep ourselves in harmony with our surroundings and with our inner being. There's no question about it. But yoga teaches us a different type of balance. It's a balance of our core, a balance of our consciousness. And from that flows a balance in every part of our life. I don't know about you, but when I try to just balance one section of my life, you may be somewhat successful, but pretty soon you realize that other things are going out of balance. You realize that uh, you have to attend to other things and sure enough you go back to what you were originally working on and you find that the balance is not quite there as it was once was. Really we have to get the core, to the core of balance, to the, to the real question of how do I balance me? <laughs> and in that, then you find that balance spreading out. In the autobiography of a yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda said this. He said, the ancient rishis laid down ineradicable patterns for spiritual living. Their hoary dictums suffice for this day and land. Not outmoded, not unsophisticated against the guiles of materialism, the disciplinary precepts mold India still. This ancient teaching of yoga yoga meditation is just as applicable now as it was in ancient India. How do we get to it? How do, what do we do? What is it? What is yoga meditation? What is it that, um, that we can understand how it balances us? Paramahansa Yogananda gave this definition of yoga meditation. He said, yoga meditation is the process of cultivating and stabilizing an awareness of our real nature through definite spiritual and psychophysical methods and laws by which the narrow ego, the flawed hereditary human consciousness, is displaced by the consciousness of the soul. This is what we're talking about. This is why yoga meditation, deep yoga practice, can balance every aspect of our life. It displaces the, the false notion that we are these bodies with the ego, with the likes and dislikes, the hurts, the pleasures, the pains. We're not this. We are the soul. We are the reflection of the infinite within. The more we tune in with it through meditation, the more we realize that things around us, things happening in our life, we can, we can withstand them. We can take them uh, as they come and they don't throw us out of balance. In the, our gurus, Paramahansa Yogananda's um, God Talks with Arjuna commentary on 
the Bhagavad Gita. This, this is um, a statement that's made in the introduction to that two-volume set. The path advocated by Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is the moderate, medium, golden path, both for the busy man of the world and for the highest spiritual aspirant. To follow the path advocated by the Bhagavad Gita would be their salvation, for it is a book of universal self-realization, introducing man to his true self, the soul, showing him how he has evolved from spirit, how he may fulfill on earth his righteous duties, and how he may return to God. The Gita's wisdom is not for dry intellectualists to perform mental gymnastics with its sayings for the entertainment of dogmatists, but rather to show a man or woman living in the world, householder or renunciant, how to live a balanced life that includes the actual contact of God by following the step-by-step -step methods of yoga. Showing us how to follow the step-by-step -step methods of yoga, which brings balance into our lives. Now, first of all, when we're talking about this, we have to realize that there's no one recipe for everyone in the world, and never will be. I remember one of the um, older renunciants, he's since passed, but he was very influential on many of the monks, Brother Premamoy, back in my early years in the ashram. Um, I had the good fortune, as many of us did, to, to be around him and hear his training on the monastic life. And he used to often tell us, whenever we thought that we had uh, everything figured out or that one formula fit all, or that even if we ever even slightly tried to judge other people, he said, remember, he says in this world, no two thumbprints are the same. He used to use that saying, no two thumbprints. In other words, if these are unique in the world, then what about this? What about this that's so complex and so multi-layered? Everyone is different. And so this idea of balancing our life, it follows that there's no one formula to do it. Certainly not balancing the different aspects of our life that are pulling us every which way. In one of the essays written by... Yogananda, beautiful essay in which he talks about different aspects of the spiritual life and what each one of us need. He had a, a section in which he talked about the uniqueness of every individual. And he titled it, Recognize the Tendencies That Make You Unique. He starts out by quoting something from Shakespeare, a famous line from Hamlet in which uh, Polonius says something very wise. And I'm reading now from, my, from our guru. Above all, to thine own self be true. This statement is the climax of a famous list of advice given by Polonius in Shakespeare's play, Hamlet. Narrowly speaking, it means to be honest with yourself. Do not do a thing that you inwardly feel to be wrong. Truly, to have a clean conscience, even if the whole world doubts you, is a joy and a strength worth all the treasures of the universe. But the words of Polonius hold a great deal more meaning than this. Conscience is not, is not the only companion of ourselves that we have to care for. There are others, too. A party of peeping desires, a group of half-sleeping tendencies, a company of live-wire wishes compose the crowd. In order to be true to ourselves, we cannot push aside these traveling companions with whom we started life. We have to be at least attentive to them, too, if we do not want to lose in life's game. There may be some in the crowd that need shackling, the appetites, jealousies, and others that are apt to choke our growth or hurt others. Some, such as selfish desires, may need strong doses of advice and treatment. There are others that are safe enough to be relied on, or at least tolerated, such as the self-preserving and social instincts. A few need to be deliberately spurred on. Sympathetic tendencies, spirit of reverence, service, love of truth. We have to attend to each propensity in a way that is most suitable. That is the proper education of the inner being. 
In other words, we must be true to ourselves, not in the sense of bringing flower offerings to every tendency we have, even the baser ones, but in the sense of recognizing the place of every one of them in the scheme of our life, and checking and subordinating or guiding and directing each one of the crowd in such a way as to make it contribute to the general well-being and happiness of the whole. In this way, every individual is a species unto himself. Though each person is a human being, one does not resemble another any more than the dress of a native Burmese resembles that of an American. The fabric may be essentially the same, both being made of cloth, but the design and style are significantly different. We're unique. We're unique. We look inside, we have certain tendencies, certain things that we have to cultivate, certain things that we have to overcome. Now, we don't look inside and say, well, this is, this is me and everything is fine. We have to work on these things. I remember one time when I was working with Diamata and uh, something came up and she looked at me and she said, you know, you should work on being a little more organized. And my answer to her, just off the top of my head, and I said, well, well, Ma, that's kind of the way I am. And she looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I realized that probably wasn't the right answer to give. That's the way I am. She said, you know how Master would answer you for that? And I also knew that she was going to tell me, which she did. She said, Master would say to you, change yourself. When you look and see that you have deficiencies in any part of your life, it's not enough to just say, well, I'm a yogi and I'm meditating and everything will be fine. We have to work at changing ourselves. And this working from both ends, both the inner self and also the outer manifestation of that, we work on it. It's a much quicker process. It's a much uh, more efficient process. Understanding yourself and working on the shortcomings. Now, I was saying earlier that uh, our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda had many... I mean, his teachings are, are, are rife with, with uh, explanations, uh, with uh, direction, with how to change ourselves, with what the ideal balanced life looks like. But there was a, something that came up some years ago that I came across, which was so interesting because it showed another aspect of the teachings that we have and that the, the wisdom uh, that comes through a guru to a disciple trying to change themselves. Now, we know that uh, as far as diet goes, um, we have certain principles that we follow here in Self-Realization Fellowship in the ashrams. And um, in Autobiography of a Yogi, our guru uh, quotes his guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar, as saying, um, follow any simple diet that's suited to one's constitution. That's basically the overall uh, idea. You know, you find what suits you and you follow that. Well, someone once asked Merlini Mata, uh, our president, former president, they wrote a letter to her and asked, uh, asked about diet and uh, what was Master's uh, way of dealing with it, what was the ideal diet. You know, many times in the beginning of our spiritual search, we think that diet becomes so important. It is important, but it's it's not that important. It's, it's uh, something we have to attend to, but it should not be all-consuming. Merlini Mata's response was just, well, it was not only a balanced response, but it showed the, the wisdom that our guru had and the, the wisdom that pours through these teachings and guidance in different areas of our life. She had written this back in, the, in a letter to a devotee who was asking about diet. She said, Master's views on diet and health were very balanced and not in any way fanatical. Sometimes he and those of us around him would have little other than raw foods and juices for a period of time. But just as often, he might decide to enjoy with us for several days nothing but curries and Indian sweetmeats made, a, made with white sugar. He very much believed in the philosophy of his guru, throw the dog a bone and forget it. You could say that the very basis of his health counsel was to eat natural foods, eat a balanced diet, and from all the essential food groups, include plenty of raw fruits and vegetables, avoid meat, and mostly use whole grains instead of refined flours and sugars. But at the same time, 
not let the mind be so conditioned to having to have health food that if you eat white flour or sugar once in a while, you get sick. He always stressed that the major factor in promoting and maintaining health is right attitude of the mind. So there must be common sense health habits, but above all, a positive, strong mind. Master had no tolerance for fanaticism. We saw him deliberately flaunt dietary rules in front of some who had the notion that it was a sin against the body to digress from health foods. This idea of looking at balanced diet through a balanced lens that our guru had, it gives great hope to all of us who are trying desperately to balance our lives and keep them in balance. I saw this through the years. I saw this with Dayamata. I saw this, as I mentioned, Brother Premamoy. They had the ability, they well knew the rules that were uh, established to keep a harmonious and, and uh, functioning society going within the ashrams. But they also had the ability to weigh where those rules and guidance should be slightly bent. Oftentimes, I saw Dayamata, she would be asked by someone, can I do something like this? And they had some plan that they had devised. It clearly needed some permission from some higher source because it was not what we normally did. And oftentimes, I saw Ma, she would think about it, and she said, yes, in this case, it's okay. She'd give her blessing on it. Sometimes she would say no. She'd say, no, that's not a good idea. And so that person would have to shelve those plans. I never knew why. But I always had a sense that each instance, each example of her looking at these things, it was unique. She took into account who those people are, what this question was, what the ramifications were. And uh, that to me was very, very inspiring because uh, none of us want to live in a, such a rigid place where Every rule has to be religiously followed. Now, our guru was very clear about certain things, and uh, um, his guidance was not just to be rigid, but it was to ensure success, that we could more and more get to that place where we feel the presence of God within. And, uh, you know, even in the early years, Dayamata came to the ashram. She told us in stories how she was longing to go back to, to Salt Lake City to visit her family. And when she went to our master and asked him, he said, no, not yet. He wouldn't allow her to go until a certain point. And he said, now you can go home. Again, see, it's the, it's the knowing how everyone is unique and having the wisdom to say that by doing this, your life is going to be more in balance you're going to be happier. You're going to be more stable. I remember speaking of uh, our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda knowing each individual. Brother Bhaktananda used to tell that story where when he first came here, he said that when, when our Guru left, uh, got in the car to leave the ashram here, he said he often would stop, I think, out front of the ashram and there were three or four monks who would gather around him. And Yogananda would talk to them. And he, uh, Brother Bhaktananda said they were very intelligent monks. They were very scientific. And he said whenever he got close enough, he heard, you know, the different discussions they were having. There were really profound discussions on science. And, and uh, one time he realized, well, gee, he's talking to them. Why not me? And so he kind of sidled up to the group, <laughs> tried to sneak up and just be uh, unobtrusive and kind of stand in the circle so that he too could enjoy the, the, the guru's presence and uh, hear what he was saying. And after he did, Master, he stopped. He looked at Brother Bhaktananda and he said to him, this is not for you. He pushed him away. This is not for you. And in those early years, Brother Bhaktivedanta couldn't understand why. You know, well, doesn't he like me as much as the others? That wasn't the point. Master was attending to each devotee as they needed him. And to these very intelligent, scientific-minded monks, he wanted to give them a little bit of something that they could, they could relate to. 
Brother Bhaktananda didn't need that. He had, uh, Master was telling him to practice the presence, to live simply, to keep his mind on God. And for, with him stepping into that circle of other monks, he was trying to take things that really weren't meant for him. An inspiring story that shows the depth of understanding of the guru and the disciple. Well, how do we achieve more balance in our lives? Let's give a few simple points. I think balance, it does happen more when we can learn to simplify our lives. Simplicity is an important concept. It's getting rid of the extraneous distractions and extraneous uh, activities that pull us away from the center of who we are. Listen to this simple sentence from Yogananda's teachings. He said, he said, be as simple as you can be. You will be astonished to see how uncomplicated and happy your life can become. Be as simple as you can be. You will be astonished to see how uncomplicated and happy your life can be. Simplicity leads to a more balanced existence. And anything we can do, especially in today's world, because it seems uh, simplicity is something that very few people understand and it's diff more and more difficult to practice. We have so much bombardment of different uh, uh, things coming into our life. Try to look for ways in which you can make your life more simple. Along those lines, he said, seek quiet places where you can regularly get away by yourself and be free to think of God. When you're with people, be with them wholeheartedly. Give them your love and attention, but also take time to be alone with God. That's a practical way to practice simplicity. Yes, with, with others, be 100% with them, but take the time to step away from that from time to time. This idea of solitude and, and being comfortable with yourself, this coronavirus isolation that we're all experiencing these days, it's an excellent time to become more and more able to be comfortable with ourselves. Use it that way. It's a really, a, it's a blessing in that way because you're not forced to be in the company of others too much so that you feel like your life is, is out of balance. And another instruction our guru gave. He said, concentration on great books, great men, great problems, great doctrines, and facts and their lessons cannot but result in high thinking. In other words, be careful about what you're putting into your mind. Be careful what you're absorbing. In this idea of being simple, put only the best. Put only the best. And you'll start seeing that that input of good information, it starts affecting the rest of your life. So be simple, seek quiet places where you can get away, and then be careful with what you put in your mind. These are three very practical points, three, three very practical ways with which to make your life more simple and consequently much more balanced. Another way it's just checking your attitude on things. You know, right attitude is so important in this, on the spiritual path and in life. Right attitude, thinking in the right way, being, interpreting things that are happening around you in the right way. Right attitude. In the ashram, we have a, a saying that we learned from early years, to be cheerful and willing, ever ready to change to be cheerful and willing, ever ready to change. You come across people like that <laughs> every once in a while, and you realize, wow, this is really, um, that's an attitude that I want to develop. Cheerful and willing, ever ready to change. And that is the, really the script that's needed, the, the operating system that's needed for any yogi who really wants to um, change their life for the better. Cheerful, willing, ever ready to change. Another thing we can work on with right attitude, the de desire to serve others. 
Yogananda says, rather than always be striving for personal happiness, try to make others happy. In being of spiritual, mental, and material service to others, you will find your own needs fulfilled. As you forget self and service to others, you will find that without seeking it, your own cup of happiness will be full. Amazing. This is it. You pour out your love, your help, your service to others, and you find that, well, look, it's changing me. It's making me more happy and more balanced. And then one other way with, with right attitude is just acceptance. In the Bhagavad Gita, Yogananda makes this statement, cosmic law sees to it that those duties that come to man in the natural course of his life are those he is meant to perform for his own welfare. Those duties which come to us in the natural course of life, they come to us for a reason. There's no mistakes. So where we find ourselves and in what conditions we find ourselves, it's all right. It's all, it's all the way it's supposed to be. The more we can remind ourselves of that, so that we don't get upset. Why is this happening to me? Why, the more we realize, okay, this is happening for a reason. It's happening that I have to learn something. The more we do that, the more we remind ourselves of that, then the more stable and the more balanced and, and accepting that we become. That's an important point. Now here's a story from Diamata. <laughs> Speaking of acceptance and uh, everything coming to you um, was meant to come to you. She said, Master and many of us disciples have been living most of the time at the Hermitage in Encinitas since he returned from India in 1936. But one day in 1948, he said to me, I want you to go back to Mount Washington and take charge of the administration of the society. This was very painful to me. First of all, I wanted to remain where Master was, and secondly, I had always resisted the idea of being a leader. I had only one desire in life, to be a bhakti yogi. For me, only devotion had meaning. So I packed up, and I went to Mount Washington to take up my new duties. Master was full of glowing ideas about organizing the work to better disseminate the Kriya Yoga message of the gurus, and I too was brimming with enthusiasm. But there was a surprise in store for me. Shortly after I began this task, Guruji moved to his little ashram in the desert and took with him most of the key disciples on whom I had been counting. He left me with only a handful of people, most of whom were wholly untrained. My first reaction was, this is impossible. Then I resigned myself to the fact that Master knew best. But then another blow fell. Master came in from the desert for a short time and called me to him. I think we ought to have a convocation next year, he said. I want you to organize it. I was shocked. This time he's gone too far, I thought. Master, I said, I cannot do it. It's physically impossible. I could see so many reasons why he should not ask me to assume this responsibility. I knew nothing about organizing convocations. There were no personnel to do the work. He had to take them all to the des desert. And besides, I was completely burdened down by the enormous demands of supervising the offices, correspondence, centers, financial, ashram matters. Master returned to the des desert that night, and I could see that he was very unhappy with my attitude. I went to my room in tears, for I could never bear to displease him. But this time I was determined not to give in, because I felt my reasons were fully justifiable. I tried to meditate, I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. My mind was too upset. So I began to analyze my attitude. So as I introspected that night in my room and objectively analyzed why I was so distressed, I had to admit the truth of the matter. I was not unable to take on this task Master had asked of me, but I was unwilling to do so. That was really what was wrong with me. To my mind, the reasons why I could not organize the convocation had seemed justified. But now I realized I was just rationalizing my own unwillingness to assume such a great responsibility. The moment I recognized the true motive behind my resisting his request, my consciousness changed. You have given your life to God unconditionally, I told myself. You cannot say to your guru, I will accept this discipline from you 
but not that one. If you have such an attitude, then how can you think your devotion is unconditional? I resolved that I would do what he had asked, and instantly a great peace came over my soul. Before I fell asleep, I determined that in the morning I would get in touch with Master at the desert and promise him to do my best in organizing the convocation he wanted. Master was always attuned to our state of consciousness. Even though he was 150 miles away, he was aware of the struggle I was going through. The first thing the next morning, he telephoned from the desert. I quickly said to him, Master, please forgive me for my unwillingness. My attitude was wrong. I don't know how to organize a convocation, and I confess that I already feel overburdened, but I promise you this, I will do my best. I can never forget how sweetly he replied, that is all I ask of you. Now this is how a great soul responds to difficulties we find ourselves in. But if we more and more remind ourselves, as we're saying, that nothing is happening in our life by accident, it's all there for some reason. It's all uh, condoned by the guru who sends it our way. Then the more we can get an attitude where we realize this is for my best. How best can I operate from this place that I'm in? Now we've been talking about ways to bring more balance into our lives through the working on our simplicity in our lives, working on right attitude. There's another way that is the most profound way. And that is through the practice of these teachings, which teach meditation. Meditation brings balance into our lives in a more profound way than anything we can do with attitude or with working on different aspects. Read again from Diamata. She was such a... One person once said to me that um, Master's teachings give the information about this path, the everything you need for instruction and inspiration. He said, Diamata, in the talks that she gave, in the books that we have of her, she was a devotee living it. And from that perspective, you get insights into how to put these profound teachings into practice. Now, this is what Diamata did when she felt that balance was slipping away from her. She said, when my mind becomes filled with problems or with decisions to make, do you know what helps me? I practice japa, taking again and again the name of God and Gurudev. My mind revolves like a wheel around one thought, Guru, 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 until I invoke his holy presence within me. Then I feel a definite mental attunement with him, and my mind becomes a flame with understanding pouring from Gurudev. You should get in the habit of invoking the presence of God and the gurus in this way. It is very simple, really. Through meditation, through living a life in which you're making the effort to tune in with those divine vibrations from our guru, from, from the divine, from God himself, this was Ma's way. She would attune herself, attune her consciousness with the divine. And in that, she would return to that peaceful, wisdom-centered, divine love in which she could deal with the many things around her that were pulling her one way or another out of balance. I told this story, and many of you have heard this, but one time I was, uh, when I was working with her, I'd come across a book, uh, pictures of saints, and one of them, there was a chapter about Padre Pio, this Italian mystic who had the stigmata and was uh, a great lover of God. And there was one picture in particular, it was taken when he was a young man, he was in the, he was in the monastery, he was, uh, picture him standing, he was in his black uh, robe um, with a collar young man and he was standing there with his hands like this showing the stigmata and the story behind it was the the bishop had said that they wanted to take a picture of him 
and uh, he always kept hidden. He always wanted to keep hidden the, the, the marks on his hands, but the bishop ordered him, uh, take a picture and let us see the stigmata. So, but you could read on his face, um, he didn't like this at all. And the expression was, uh, um, I'm doing this out of obedience, but there's no, uh, uh, I'm not enjoying one aspect of this, a really uh, almost disdainful doing it. At the same time, the overwhelming feeling of the picture was, this is a holy man. <laughs> you just got the sense that just the way he was looking into the camera, his posture, his, this was a very holy man. And one time, <laughs> I, was, I was with Diamata and I told her that I saw this picture. And my question to her, I said, how did he become so holy? What did he do? And she, whenever you ask her a question like that, or whenever you did, uh, she'd always take a moment to think about it. And, you know, the answers really came from a profound depth within her. And I always felt like uh, she knows what she's talking about. She said, well, he didn't spend all of his time with his brothers. And he practiced the presence of God. And in that, she summarized the, the formula that, Padre Pio had used to become the holy man that he did, that he was. She did the same, you know, she did the same. She practiced the presence and um, there was a, I'm telling you all these stories that come to mind. <laughs> she had a little um, thing that she kept framed above her door in her room. And one day the frame was becoming a little bit uh, needed some repair. So she took it down, she gave it to me, she said, could you fix this? And of course, you know, you, you do whatever you can to fix whatever she needs. Um, and it was, a, it was something uh, from Master's teachings, and Master had seen it. Yogananda had seen it, and then he, when he was passing it, he signed the bottom and put a date on it. And so then that, that became something that was really, um, you know, a treasure. So she had it framed in her room and it was on the wall. And in fixing this little frame, um, taking the thing out, cleaning it, putting it back together, I saw that on the back of this card that Master had signed was just a pencil, a pencil script in Diamata's hand, which said, keep your mind on God today. And I realized here's a little reminder that she used to use you know, back when she was probably starting out, it was probably, you know, 1930s or 40s, just a simple thing. And I don't know, sometimes when I saw this, these simple manifestations of what saintliness looked like, even to the point of it's just a little card that she scribbled a reminder on, um, it was very inspiring to me because it showed that there is a way to, to practice this teaching, to... Uh, to inculcate these teachings into your being, that you become uh, a more spiritual person. And, you know, sometimes we think that saints are born and they just uh, become saints of their own. They work at it, whether it be a Padre Pio, whether it be a Diamata, whether it be any one of us. This is what we do. We, we keep working at these things and we keep manifesting them in newer ways. Meditation. Yogananda said, if you work all the time, you become, may become too mechanical and sacrifice God to your work. And if you rely too much on discriminating and reasoning, you may lose sight of God that way. And if you have devotion for God without working for Him, your devotion may dissipate into emotion. Meditation balances all of these factors. Meditation balances all of these factors. So as we strive for more and more balance in this world, um, keep your mind on, on the divine, keep your mind on, on things that raise your consciousness to a spiritual state. And try to hold on to that 
aspect of the divine within. Because the more we do that, then the more we feel that our life is stable. Our guru had this wonderful expression, to stand unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds. Kind of an ideal, you know, that no matter what's happening around you, you are standing unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds. Another one of his sayings, to be a prince of peace, sitting on the throne of poise, directing the kingdom of my activities. This is the balanced individual. This is the balanced yogi. A prince of peace sitting on the throne of poise, directing the kingdom of my activities. Let me finish with this thought from our guru's writings. He said, if you develop that calm intensity of concentration, you will find that a time comes when no matter what else you are doing, days and nights pass with your mind inwardly absorbed in God. May we all reach that state and realize that we are these divine souls asked to live out this little incarnation in a divine way. God bless you all. Guru bless you all. Now let's practice the healing service. Please stand. Let us put our attention within. Please repeat after me. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies. Rub the hands together. Feel your building energy. Now let us raise the hands and chant Om for healing of the body. Om. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their minds. Rotate the hands. Again, you're building energy in the hands and arms. Now let's raise the hands and chant Om for healing of the mind. Om. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their souls. For healing of the soul. Om. Now let's raise the arms. Once more, let's chant Om for world peace and harmony. Om. We have our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, bless me that through my efforts and through thy grace, I may live a balanced life, ever in tune with thee. And may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen. May God and our Guru bless us all.